Greetings Bio 6611. This week we'll be talking about how we can use conditional probability in the calculation and evaluation of the performance of diagnostic testing. We'll start with a brief background of why we're interested in doing this and introduce our example that will motivate all of our calculations and derivations. We'll then look at how we can calculate in this lecture set the performance of the test itself. One common use of conditional probability is to summarize the performance of screening and diagnostic tests. For example, we may have some either gold standard test that already exists to measure a disease status, or perhaps we can identify disease status, but maybe it takes time, money, effort, or is too intensive. On the alternative, we might be able to develop some new test to screen or diagnose a disease that we're hoping will do a good job of correctly predicting the disease status. We can set up the results if we design a study to do this in the form of what we call a confusion matrix or a two by two table. You'll see here some similarities to what we saw with power and sample size. For example, we have both true positives and true negatives, much like we had type one error in power. We can imagine here that cell A represents the true positives, that our test, whatever we come up with, correctly predicts the disease status, whereas the true negatives represent the test predicting a negative status and correctly matching a controller negative prediction for the disease status. This then, of course, stands in contrast to our two possible cells B and C that would be the incorrect conclusion, where the test predicts a positive outcome or that you're positive for the disease, but it's actually negative and you don't have the disease. Or in C, the case we predict negative, but you actually are positive. It was a false negative. And we'll see we can set things up in this way in many contexts, both for power and type 1 error, illustrating those outcomes, here for conditional probability, and also in other lectures this week, looking at the calculation of uh, effect estimates in the case of 2 by 2 tables. So how do we summarize the performance of diagnostic tests? We can really think of these as a prediction problem. Based on our tests, we are trying to predict the true outcome. Now oftentimes, again, we want to do this because it might be cheaper, quicker, less invasive, or have some other benefit relative to the gold standard or knowing that true status of the disease otherwise. Now we'll see in these following lecture sets, there are multiple types of summaries that are beneficial in their own ways that we'll look at, in this case, the properties of the test, such as accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. In the next lecture deck, we'll look at the predictive utility of the test with things like predictive uh, values, likelihood ratios, and the posterior odds. And finally, we'll close out this set of three uh, lecture sets with the performance across different possible thresholds as evaluated by receiver operating characteristic curves, or ROC curves. We'll also see going through these slides that some of these summaries will depend on the prevalence of the disease, or in other words, we can think of it as the probability of having the disease or what proportion of the population of interest has a condition. This is also called the prior probability of having the disease because absent knowing anything else, if we know 10% of a population has a disease, for any random person, we would at least start with that as our guess that they might have the disease, a 10% chance. For a motivating example that we'll use for the next two slide sets, let's consider the condition of coronary heart disease, or CHD. It's a disease of the blood vessels that supply the heart and is one of the most common types of heart disease. For our example, we're going to assume that in our population of interest, the prevalence of CHD is 20%. Or in other words, we can say the probability someone has CHD is equal to 0.2. Now let's assume there are two ways we can currently diagnose coronary heart disease. One is via an angiogram, which is our gold standard, and the other is a new test we wish to evaluate a treadmill test. So essentially someone will run on the treadmill and will use those results to predict if they have or don't have coronary heart disease. Now we might ask ourselves the question obviously, how good is the treadmill test as an approximation? I mean it's cheaper and easier to administer than an angiogram, so how well does it do? 
Now to answer this question, we would design a study. So in our case, we're going to assume we designed a study that enrolled 50 cases and 50 controls, or in other words, 50 people who had CHD that we knew of and 50 who we knew didn't have it. In other words, we've really fixed the numbers in our study based on the results of the angiogram. So the sample prevalence we have here, 50%, doesn't actually match the population prevalence we know to be 20%. This just brings up an important point that we'll see more so in the next lecture set, but in general, the prevalence estimated from a study with fixed cases will not reflect the population prevalence unless we designed it to enroll that actual population prevalence. So let's look at the results of our study. Now we have over here again the results of our new diagnostic test, the treadmill test. It can be positive or negative. And we should walk through a little notation here as well. Um, we're using the letter T to represent our test here, which we see by positive, without any bar over it. One common way in diagnostic testing to note then the absence of a test or result is the same letter or representation, but with a bar over it, or potentially a dash next to the value, or an apostrophe like T apostrophe. Likewise, for the angiogram, we have both positive disease as just D or negative disease as D bar. Now, in our test, we see that we have 40 individuals who were correctly predicted to have uh, coronary heart disease as determined by the angiogram and our pre treadmill test, and 45 that were negative on both. We then see we have a little discordance here with five being predicted positive, but not having coronary heart disease, at least not as measured by the angiogram, and 10 being negative, but actually having coronary heart disease. It may be helpful now to jot down this table somewhere helpful that you can easily reference since we'll be using these values for our following calculations, but I won't be having this table on the screen. So let's briefly talk about the performance of the diagnostic test itself. How do we measure test performance? There are three major attributes we use to describe how well a test does. It's accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity. These are all attributes of screening and diagnostic tests that we can describe. One important feature here is that these do not depend on the prevalence of the disease in our population and will frequently be estimated from studies that have a large number of cases with and without the disease, or potentially in our case here, designed in a way that we ensure we have at least some number of cases relative to some number of controls to see how it performs. Accuracy serves as an overall summary of performance as we'll see in the following slide, whereas sensitivity and specificity will focus on the performance of the test in those who do or don't actually have the disease respectively. So let's start with accuracy. And one thing you'll see throughout these slides is that we're going to try to provide, where appropriate, both the probability notation, but also the cells we would see in our two by two confusion matrix. So accuracy is one of the most straightforward measures of test performance. It's just the proportion of correct classifications. So for example, we see that accuracy is the probability that we have both the, tr the test predicting the disease and actually having the disease, and also the opposite. The test predicts you don't have the disease and you actually don't have the disease. We can do this calculation briefly below, but if you'd like, you can pause for a second and try this yourself before we work through it together. Okay, so let's take a look at calculating the accuracy of our tests here. We see we have cells A plus D, so that's going to correspond to 40 plus 45. We then add up the total number of cells we observed in the study, which we can note is 100 people total. In this case, then, we would say we have 85 out of 100, or we have 85%. In other words, for our interpretation, the treadmill test is 85% accurate at predicting if someone has CHD. One thing you'll note as well as we go through these slides is that for each one of these measures, I'm providing an interpretation template. So you can fill in the result, but also note you can apply this to future problems when you're evaluating these different concepts. 
So what about the idea of sensitivity, or also corresponding to that, the idea of a false negative rate as its complement? Let's start with sensitivity, which is also known as the true positive rate, or TPR. It's the probability that a test will indicate disease among those who actually have the disease. In other words, how good is our test at detecting or ruling in a disease when the disease is actually there? Now we see our conditional probability at play here because we see that sensitivity then is really equal to this idea that the probability you have a positive test given you actually have the disease. Based on our identities and properties of conditional probability, we can rewrite this in our next step as the probability of having both the treatment, or excuse me, the positive test and the disease divided by the overall probability of having the disease from our sample. Or in words, the probability of having a positive treadmill test and having coronary heart disease divided by the probability of having coronary heart disease in our sample. One other important thing to note though is that if we take one minus the sensitivity or one minus the true positive rate, we also have the summary of the false negative rate, which is another feature some people are sometimes interested in. So let's take a second to calculate the sensitivity for our data before walking through it together. Okay, based on the formulas we have above and the cells in our two by two table or our confusion matrix, we can note that the sensitivity is going to be equal to that probability of having both the positive treadmill test and coronary heart disease based on the angiogram, or cell A with 40 cases, divided by A plus C, or the total number of people who actually have coronary heart disease in our sample, which is our 40 again from A, plus the 10 cases where we predicted they didn't have the disease, but they did. Writing out our math here, we see we have 40 over 50, or an 80% probability as we would maybe think of it, or 0.8 if we want to keep it as a proportion. But writing that into our interpretation then, the sensitivity says that if someone has CHD, there is an 80% probability that the treadmill test will then be positive. It helps to describe how likely it is that someone, again having the actual disease of interest, will actually have a positive result of our screening or diagnostic test. This then stands in contrast to the idea of specificity, or the true negative rate, TNR. The probability here is that a test will not indicate disease among those without the disease. In other words, how good is a test at ruling out a disease when the disease actually isn't there, when you're actually a control? Um, how well does the test do at identifying that? Much like before, we can see we've written it out both in terms of our probability statements generally, but also in the context of our treadmill tests and coronary heart disease problem. Based on this idea of specificity in probability terms, this is equivalent to writing the probability that the test is negative given you're someone who doesn't have the disease. In our next step here, we then see that that's equal to the probability of having a negative test and not having the disease divided by the marginal probability of not having the disease. Or again, over here, we just see we write it in terms of our problem. Much like excuse me, sensitivity, specificity also has a complement where one minus specificity, or one minus the true negative rate, is going to be equal to that false positive rate, which again is something people may be interested in to know how frequently we may have a false positive. So let's pause the video for a second to do this calculation before we work on it together. Okay, so our specificity calculation, based on the formula we have above, or looking at the cells we're going to plug our values into, we see that we have 45 individuals who were negative on the treadmill test and also don't have CHD. We can then note that adding cells B and D we have 5 plus 45, or 45 over 50 equals 0 0.9. In other words, the interpretation for specificity is that if someone does not have CHD, there is a 90% probability that the treadmill test will be negative.
And again, just so we can actually apply that idea of a false negative and a false positive rate, we can do the calculation here briefly. So I again encourage you to pause the video quickly before we work through it together. Okay, let's apply the results we saw on the previous slides. For our false negative rate, we can note, again, it's just 1 minus the sensitivity, so 1 minus 0 0.8, which will equal 0 0.2. In other words, we have a false negative rate of 0.2, or a 20% chance of having a false negative. For the false positive, then, we'll just take 1 minus 0 0.9, equals 0 0.1, and we then therefore can conclude that we have a 10% probability of making a false positive. That'll conclude our discussion of evaluating the diagnostic test before we move on to look at how we can actually apply it in practice in a real world setting based on predicting the probability of disease.